Hello and welcome to this voyage of Boggle Rocket. We're sharing the skies with a fearsome fire drake for today's destination, Dungeons and Dragons Red Dragon's Tail. Let's start with the word vintage, which can just mean the year a particular wine is from, but it can also mean a time period when something of quality was being regularly produced. To spoil this discussion from the outset, I think Red Dragon's Tale here comes pretty close to a return to the level of quality and whimsy held by only the most beloved vintage LEGO themes from throughout the decades. This won't be a review as such, so I won't cover absolutely everything, though I'll certainly go through many of the set's qualities and issues. It's more of a discussion of its place in LEGO's history and their current landscape. Think retrospective, without the retro. A spective. A perspective. Let's begin our adventure where our heroes start theirs, at the inn. Clear evidence from the get-go that the build style of this set, though large, is very simple. There are definitely parts where the rock work and detail are a little lacking. Come on guys, stick a leaf there or something. My partner built Snow White's cottage while I was building this set, and I'd call that set hyper-detailed, where this is not. The inn itself is particularly cramped. A good comparison between the styles is the brick-built door with wrought iron frame, and this new single-piece mould for the D&D doors. This simplicity annoyed me a little as I was building the first few bags of this set, but then, when I built this buried treasure trove containing a key used to open a nearby door concealed by Dark Souls-style illusory rocks and guarded by a tentacled terror, I experienced a complete reversal of emotion akin to the moment I discovered Escape the Lost Tomb was designed by an adventurer's fan, largely as an homage to sets of that era. Back then, I thought Lost Tomb was blocky and ugly before realising it was an intentionally vintage aesthetic. This time, I saw D&D as overly kiddified until I discovered the methodology behind its layout. You see, the thing which gives rise to the aspects of the set I enjoy the most is the thing which is arguably the whole reason the set was made to accommodate the accompanying Dungeons & Dragons mini-adventure booklet and mesh the 5e, that's Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, system with LEGO's system of interlocking bricks. The example I just gave is but a small segment of a continuous flow of in-universe events which will take you through the entire set. This gateway to tailored exploration of the set itself is almost essential for understanding the meaning of all the details. The hidden spellbooks, the poisonous plants, the effects of all the various weapons and armour like this cloak or the dwarf's weird upside down flashlight, who should be kept in this cell, the fact that this is a bag of holding, the names of the characters, the fact that these things aren't rocks but are actually types of living slime called black puddings, why the sorcerer has three heads, what this bottle of either ketchup or mustard is for, it's hot sauce by the way. Well, you wouldn't know any of it without the booklet. You could come up with your own explanations for all of these things without the aid of the booklet, even without having any idea what Dungeons & Dragons is, but you'd need a strong imagination and a familiarity with LEGO's history of implied visual storytelling, and I think that's exactly the kind of person who this set is for. For starters, there's the myriad hidden potions, weapons and equipment dotted around the map, and yes, I did just instinctively call it a map as if it's a sandbox level in a video game, reminding me strongly of the hidden jewels in Adventurers or collectible chrome armour in Knight's Kingdom sets. Granted, that's something I'm loath to admit Ninjago does well too. But just look, grabbing this key activates a classic trapdoor, there's a classic plant element you can brush aside to find a hidden entrance. The classic Harry Potter spiral staircase makes a rare appearance, and there's implied extensions to the landscape outside the set with the surrounding water's edge, a la Dino Island. One thing you can't avoid discussing is the giant, winged, fire-breathing elephant in the room, Cinder Howl. This creature build is so reminiscent of the best Vikings creatures like Nidhogg and Midgard Serpent, and is the best dragon Legos ever built, period. And doesn't the Displacer Beast remind anyone else of Fenris Wolf? When a loose, big, ugly rock piece, now infamous among the community, fell out of the box, I laughed out loud, and three of LEGO's practically unchanged skeletons feature too. The set truly feels like it draws from the very best of LEGO's repertoire. Strangely, the only glaring qualms I still have with the set are where the shadow of the modern breaks that illusion, like dispelling the magical disguise of an evil warlock. I'm not at all a fan of LEGO's current use of horns, tentacles, and overly intricate filigree printed in white for smoke. It just looks like there's toothpaste being squeezed out of the inn. 
Cinderhal's head is too heavy for its more modern Mixel ball joint, which is a huge oversight. This is going back on a previous point, but I'd much rather have less articulation or more exposed Technic like their older designs than a floppy dragon. And I'm getting more than a little sick of these pine trees in every 18 plus set. As a plant lover, to me they just look like fronds rather than conifer needles, because they are fronds. An issue unfortunately compounded by these examples where the piece is just brazenly flipped and slightly recolored to depict the ferns it was originally created to portray. I much prefer the classic look of the awakened tree, so it's good that he dominates the meadow section. But here's where we reach the big disconnect between the set's greatest strength and what I feel is an unfortunate mishandling of its production. Because the majority of the landscape, characters, creatures and accessories all feel so classic LEGO and rich in modern narrative, I think the booklet should definitely have been included with the set. Inside the box, not hidden away on a web page somewhere, through a QR code which just takes you to the store page for the set you've already bought. The booklet is practically essential for truly delving into every aspect and the instructions just don't explain it enough. I think the existence of the RPG adventure is also the reason the instructions contain none of the little design trivia notes we're accustomed to with an 18 plus set like this, but which are noticeably absent here. It'd be nice to know that this is a painting of the innkeeper's parents, and that it conceals a hidden crack in the rocks to look into the dungeon from the bedroom of the inn itself. The RPG booklet itself is gorgeously illustrated, using painterly depictions of the set like something out of a classic LEGO instruction booklet comic rather than ugly renders or badly cropped photos. And apologies that these are screenshots rather than actual footage because, yes, you can download the PDF for free. Well then, what's the problem? Well. If you want to flip through real pages, you need to shell out a whopping 2,700 LEGO Insiders points for the physical version. In the UK, you'd have to spend nearly £350 on LEGO to acquire that many. More money than the actual set costs, so you won't even accrue enough points to get the booklet unless you buy something else alongside it, a sales tactic which also feels openly callous and deliberate. To me, in one stroke, the publicly accessible digital version both invalidates the need for customers to shell out for the physical booklet, while simultaneously acknowledging the fact the set couldn't have been released without it. If it could stand on its own, LEGO would have completely locked the booklet behind the paywall for only the most avid fans, but they've opted for the lesser of two evils rather than striving for the best of both, and it's a massive shame, because the passion clearly poured into the adventure booklet pulls together the threads of an initially mishmash set and elevates them to great heights. To return to my point about the set being designed around this booklet by necessity, I genuinely think that's what makes it superior to similar sets like the Viking Village. Just like the Orient Expedition sets which utilised a built-in card game, or the RPG mechanics bolted onto that one wave of Ninjago sets, the features here are all playful without being intrusive because they're not gimmicks, they're part of the very DNA of the set. This axe trap is so reminiscent of features from sets like this guard tower in the original Knight's Kingdom line, and the trapdoor is straight out of so many classic sets, from Pirates and Harry Potter to Alpha Team and Western. It's the fact that so many of these action features are hidden away, organically part of the surrounding landscape or architecture, that makes me so glad LEGO are finally understanding we, the ones who physically put the set together, don't need giant red levers to signpost that part of that set does something. Because this is a set which was designed for adults, but intended to be played with. I don't mean it has a couple of snazzy, very well designed features like the Lion Knight's Castle's Drawbridge or Portcullis. I mean its very structure facilitates taking its sections apart and, well, playing around with them. Whether it's having your heroes eat hot wings and enjoy glasses of definitely not mead or beer in the inn, sidestep traps as they scale the tower, fight owlbears in the meadow, brave the darkness of the caverns, ascend the staircase in the beholder's lair, or battle skeletons on the ramparts. It's all made easy by a construction which I initially considered overly simplistic, but which I now see is crucial to the set's fun factor and accessibility. With LEGO Dungeons & Dragons, I've experienced another complete reversal of opinion brought about by a single detail I didn't discover until after I'd made my initial judgments. It's only when I unearthed the true point of the set that I realised how elegantly its design meshed rather than clashed with its features and play pattern. 
I admit it's a fine line. I don't want all my adult-oriented display sets to be clogged up by big swathes of simplistic detail to better enhance a play value I'm not going to utilise, nor am I saying that they should be filled to the brim with tons of fiddly details you won't even see when it's on your shelf, leading to half-baked features like this bouncing fire in the Viking village. For me, El Dorado is still a set which strikes that balance effectively. It has the cannons, it has the boats, it has the trapdoor, it has sizeable expanses of studs to place minifigures on, but it also has the gorgeous cobbled slope, modular construction, and vintage elegance befitting a classic. D&D, meanwhile, doesn't have the luxury of standing on the shoulders of an iconic theme, and if the compromise LEGO needed to make to affordably achieve the kind of organic adventuring and playability of the set was making the construction simpler, I've quickly come to accept that. Because, let's be honest, on first impression alone, and my heart breaks a little saying this, so please don't take it as harsh criticism, I think D&D's lack of reliance on nostalgia means the set works harder to look far more exciting to the average viewer than something like the huge grey mass of the Lion Knight's castle, or the recent medieval village, and that's coming from me, a borderline brittle brown obsessive. The castle has lovely hidden hideouts and interiors, yes, but they're just that hidden. It's like a museum exhibit, and getting it on and off a shelf is a light workout. D&D, though, is practically portable in comparison. You can just pop sections off it to show curious guests. I compare Red Dragon's Tale to the first season of The Mandalorian. Uh, hear me out. The comment which most summed up my thoughts on that show was that it was of such high quality because it wasn't just a shallow retread inspired by other Star Wars products and media, it was a bold new take inspired by the same things Star Wars was itself inspired by in the first place. Westerns, Seven Samurai, Flash Gordon. Lego D&D follows the same principle. Red Dragon's Tale has done something very few of the company's recent multi-hundred dollar sets have achieved. It's taken me back to my childhood not simply because it's a throwback inspired by an existing vintage theme, but because it's a fresh, original set inspired by the sense of play, strong narrative focus and rich world building LEGO was founded on in the first place. This is one which I don't think will gather dust like the rest of my collection, and I'm sure like the majority of the collections of people watching this video. At the end of the day, when I look at Red Dragon's Tale, it lights a fire. A warm, adventurer-roasting fire within my heart to embrace that childlike sense of adventure and actually play with my Lego. And that hasn't happened in a very long time indeed. That's all for this voyage of Boggle Rocket. Who knows where it'll go next? There's a few destinations on the horizon, and I hope you'll come along for the trip.